it was always possible to build distributed systems and replicated databases before, obviously, <laughs> right? So th this is not new. What I think is new about the edge is this paradigm in which you can do all of that in an automatic, transparent way without having to understand my primer is here, this is what's happening. So Turso will give you an URL, a URL, right? Uh, and this is the URL you're gonna use to query, write, do anything. And then everything is done automatically for you. Uh, when you set up a new replica, your application doesn't have to be aware of that. I will route you automatically to the right replica. Uh, and it's the same thing for the writes. So you can just write from any replica and that replica routes to, to uh, the right place. So you don't have to worry about any of that. You just get your URL and you write and read from it. Robert Costa, welcome to Software Engineering Daily. Alex, thanks for having me. Awesome. Yeah. So you are the founder and CEO at Chisel Strike, and I am uh, very excited to have you on because I feel like there's this SQLite renaissance going on, and and yes. I, I just want to talk about it and know more about it. So uh, you know that's the lead. But tell me about Chisel Strike and about Terso and what you all do at, at Chisel Strike. Awesome. Uh, happy to. Uh, so Chisel Strike is a company that I founded uh, with my co-founder Pekka uh, in in 2000 in the end of 2021. Uh, Pekka and I worked together at the Linux kernel. Uh, so just to briefly touch on my background, uh, I started my career, uh, my first 10 years uh, while I was working with the Linux kernel. I worked with things like virtualization, the KVM hypervisor, storage systems, the x86 boot sequence, uh, all sorts of uh, low-level stuff like that. Uh, and Pekka at the time was the maintainer of the memory management subsystem for Linux. And this is how I started to get to hate him uh, because I had to get my code through him. We still have a very good, interesting love and hate relationship. Uh, I hate him 95% of the time and I love him 5% of the time, but that's enough for us to, to get the company together. And after that, uh, we, we, uh, he followed me. I mean, he's been following me this whole time, but uh, he followed me into a company, uh, that Avi Kiviti, the founder of the KVM hypervisor, uh, created. Uh, the company was doing like an operating system thing. Uh, it was a kernel for virtual virtual machines. Uh, so it was a kernel written in C++ uh, and it didn't work. Uh, technically it did, but it didn't get any market traction. Uh, and then it pivoted to a database, like a petabyte scale NoSQL database called Scylla, which was a re-implementation of Apache Cassandra in C++. So we've been working together in, for 20 years, databases, kernels, operating systems, low level stuff. And at the end of 2021, uh, we look around the market a little bit and we try to understand, like we were very interested in, in starting something together and we're trying to understand why, first of all, I don't want to write a new database, just that there are too many databases. Like uh, I, I, I later, as I started uh, getting more acquainted with the framework uh, and JavaScript ecosystem, uh, I started to feel less about that because there are too many databases. Go look at JavaScript frameworks. There's, it's a lot more. <laughs> right. Yeah. But, uh, but, but we had this feeling like there's just too many databases. Like I don't think the world needs yet another database. But are the databases like they are today the thing that are going to power the future? So let's look at what's going on. And then we started having chats with people. We started like talking to friends and friends of friends, uh, front-end developers, back-end developers. And we understood that one of the things that I have a thesis like behind the creator, creation of a strike, which is the following, um, giving part of my, my golden here for, <laughs> but like sure. it's the person making the decisions, like the persona uh, of making the decisions of which database to use is changing. And it's changing because of things like Cloudflare, Cloudflare workers and Vercel functions and, 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 and edge functions. You don't need necessarily like a application developer can now go and have a very competent backend without any help. So like how what do we do to bridge that gap? So that was the, that was what we had in mind. And and one of the things that about this space that's very interesting is how much we're seeing bus and and reliance on the edge. Right? So we wanted to, you know, think about that space and it was clear to us that uh, to do that we would have to have a database that works very well from those environments. Uh, that serves very well those people uh, and and matches very well uh, what the edge is. So that was the, the yeah, thinking and, behind creation of the Turso is our database, right? Chisel Strike is the company. Absolutely. And, and so you talk about the edge. You have this great post on like what the heck is the edge. Tell me about like these these two different conceptions of the edge and sort of what you're, you're aiming at with Turso. Yeah. So it's interesting because lots of people mistake the edge for serverless. Uh, and I think they're the same thing. They're not the same thing, right? So serverless is, uh, there's the usual joke, like serv there, there, it's, there are servers somewhere, right? But serverless allow a paradigm 
uh, in, in which you essentially don't worry about servers. Uh, you just write your code. You're, you're, you're no longer writing services. You're writing functions. Uh, and, it, and those functions just run uh, when something happens. And, you know, you don't have to worry about provisioning. You don't have to worry about scaling. Uh, those functions are just being executed. Uh, and I think because uh, Cloudflare does edge through serverless, lots of people conf conflate the two. But if you look at Fly.io, for example, they do Edge without doing serverless. It's, so it's just, uh, an Edge at the end of the day really just means a paradigm in which you can write an application that runs in multiple geographies much, much closer uh, than uh, the cloud would allow you. So for example, our database in the US alone allow you to have 11 regions. Uh, it's not only about like US one, uh, East one, West one, etc. cetera. You, you have 11 regions uh, to, to choose from. And, and that, that's North America, actually. My Canadian friends will hate me because I've made this mistake, but like <laughs> nine in the US, two in Canada. <laughs> but yeah. uh, it, it's just uh, in North America alone, we have 11 regions to choose from uh, as opposed to the cloud. So I mean, now, now you're really trying to go the extra mile. Uh, we know that like a, people go through great lengths to reduce the lat latency of their application, but you're fighting physics uh, if you need to go from US West one to the Midwest and vice versa. Right? So you really want to put all these regions close to you. Uh, and again, you can do this with a serverless paradigm or you can do this with a serverful paradigm as Fly is doing. Uh, our database works well with both. Awesome. Okay. And just so like, I understand it, like when I think of the edge, like originally it's it's CDNs and sort of pops right with like static content on on the edge closer to your customers and now with with cloudflare workers with with fly.io um cloudfront functions all that sort of stuff you're getting compute closer to the edge but a lot of that compute still has to go back to like a central database yes. right or, or something if you're so unless it's like you know stuff that doesn't need a database which is less interesting in most of the cases you're not really yeah. pushing everything to the edge but then but then Turso helps sort of take the data to the edge as well that's right. That, that's why we wanted to, to, to write the database this way, right? Because essentially, again, this, we, and we do, I think you hit the right note with the evolution of this thing. The edge starts uh, as the CDN, right? Uh, and this is like the, I've, I've been calling this the web edge because in our industry, we love to name different things with the same name just to spark confusion. Yeah. Uh, but like the IoT folks, they've been talking about the edge as well for a long time. But there's a difference. When you're talking about the IoT edge, you have, you're going all the way to the devices, uh, which is again, the edge of the network. That's why it has yeah. the same name. But it's very different from the Cloudflare kind of web edge because the Cloudflare web edge, it's a server side thing that is always online. So what you're trying to do is just be close to your users. The IoT edge is not always online. So this is where you get things like CRDT and again, there's also, there, 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 you also have a very strong SQLite presence there because you're like you at the device. But this is a little bit different than the web edge. And you start as the CDN. Uh, now you're just serving like static things. Uh, and with things like uh, Edge Functions from, from Dino Deploy and Netlify, Cloudflare workers, what you want to do is you want your compute to be close to the Edge and Y, to create, to allow your users to have those dynamic experiences, not just the static experience. Now, the missing piece of the puzzle is the data edge, which is what we try to bridge with Turso. Awesome. And so, so I look at Turso and I look at your, your sort of private beta announcement that was a few months ago back in January. Yeah. And it says it's a SQLite compatible database that you can query over HTTP and replicate to many regions across the world, which is just like, it totally blows my mind because that's not what I think of with, with SQLite, right? Querying over HTTP, multi-region, all this stuff. So, so just so I understand, like it, it's SQLite, but I'm, I'm, I'm not sort of opening a local file like I, I usually would with SQLite. I'm, I'm connecting over HTTP to, to your service. Is that correct? Yes, uh, and just to clarify, and I think we're going to have the opportunity to talk about that later, uh, this is built on a fork of SQLite. Uh, so we fork SQLite to bring this to the market. Um, and when you're developing, so the idea is that when you are developing, you can do this development locally. Another thing, by the way, when we, when we were discovering what are those people that are building applications uh, at the front end, what is their workflow? You go to any framework tutorial, uh, and even things like Prisma, Remix, uh, Astro, they all have a local SQLite example. Why? Because it's just the easiest thing to get started with, right? So we want to keep this experience. And the way you develop is just should your, should your platform allow, uh, for example, you cannot do this uh, with Cloudflare Wrangler just because they don't have any local story. Uh, but should your uh, tech stack allow, you can develop those things locally in a SQLite file. That's right. That, that's how you develop this. 
but then what we've done, I mean, Turso is not just LibSQL or SQLite. Turso is a database built with SQLite at its core. Uh, so we have something, but this is also part of the LibSQL fork. Uh, it's, it's a mode of SQLite that allows you to have a server wrapper uh, layer to, uh, that essentially allows you to query it over HTTP. Right, so that, that's what it's doing. It's still SQLite. I mean, we, we don't, it's not like a Postgres server. And there are reasons for that. And the reasons for that is like a, we, we touched on that briefly, but the edge is very different than the cloud. Uh, why can't you have the cloud in 11 regions? Because it wouldn't be economical, right? So you put the edge there, which is essentially like smaller servers with less power. Uh, so if you really want to go to the edge, uh, you need something that runs with fewer resources and, and it's a lot simpler, right? So SQLite is the right technology for this, which I think why we're seeing this renaissance. Uh, but, we, but we essentially decided let's put SQLite as the local database. But now we wrap a very thin uh, server layer that gets those resources over HTTP. And again, the reason for that is that the paradigm uh, is functions. So when you're executing a function, that function is ephemeral. It exists for like 10 milliseconds, 15 milliseconds. You don't have time to download the full database. So the next best thing uh, is to just allow, <coughs> get you as close as possible to your region. Uh, or do HTTP and why HTTP? Because most of those environments don't even let you open a TCP connection and then go from there. We do have a feature uh, that is being uh, part of our public beta now that actually allows you to create a replica in your own infrastructure. So if you don't have a serverless thing, uh, if you don't have a serverless thing, if, if, you have, if you're doing something like Fly.io, for example, Koyab or, or many others, uh, Fermion, whatever infrastructure you have, uh, you can now build a replica uh, inside your serverful infrastructure. So now we go. Now we can use files. I mean, now it's a different story, right? But th this is made. The HTTP thing is essentially bridging the limitations of Cloudflare workers, Dino deploy, Vercel functions, and etc. Awesome. And and with that HTTP, what what is what's the auth story around how, how you know when you're connecting? Is it more network based, like sort of security group stuff, or is it like password type thing, or what's that? Uh, no, we were inspired by the success of MongoDB, so we decided not to secure it at all. You can just go and delete it all. I'm just joking. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> there is a there is a user password uh, stream that we discourage, but it exists, and then you can create a JWT token. Uh, to get a token, you get this authentication token and use that. Right? Awesome. Okay. And then, so how many regions in total do you support? You said 11 in North America. How many is it around the world? 26. 26. And, and are those running in different cloud providers? Are they like, where, where are those, how are you running those regions? Yeah. So uh, at the moment, most of our infrastructure is on fly.io, uh, but we are already actually making good progress. So we want to allow other pieces of infrastructure as well. Uh, part of it to make the, uh, especially with the, 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 the more, most important services to allow the on-prem replicas to work. Uh, they work now, but like, with an easier setup. So we want to support some of those other providers out of the box. Uh, and it, it is possible to, to, you know, our architecture would allow you to run even more regions than that, right? Yep, very cool. Okay, so you've had private beta open for a little bit. Public beta is now available. People go sign up and do that. I, I guess, what sort of use cases have you have you really been seeing uh, adoption with, with Trusa? Yeah, so, so the use cases that we see uh, excitement the most about are really, unsurprisingly, the same use cases that were already moving to the edge with their compute. Uh, e-commerce, I think, is, is the big driver. E-commerce is the web, is the use case in which you have a person in your, at your store and taking a hundred milliseconds versus taking 10 milliseconds is a huge difference in, in the experience. So you want to provide those dynamic experiences and you want to be there uh, at the edge. The other one that we see a lot is uh, experimentation platforms, A-B testing, things like that. Uh, I think there is a lot uh, about feature flags as well, uh, configuration. Uh, Vercel, for example, they do have a simple database that they support, as far as I understand, uh, that's edge ready and they, it's used for configuration. Uh, again, if you, if you, if you have a, an application that needs to start and then you need to check some configuration, if the state is 100 milliseconds away, you just introduced 100 milliseconds of startup time for no reason, right? So those are the main use cases that we see, uh, but it is very early. And I encourage, uh, you know, if, you, if folks uh, uh, listening to this, if you have a use case that uh, you think this will be a great fit for that I haven't mentioned, get in touch. Awesome. Yeah. What about in terms of just like, 
Is, is there like a maximum size I should be thinking about with, with Turso or something like that? Or can it, can it go up to hundreds of gigs or even terabytes or like what, what, what should I be thinking about there? Yeah, uh, that, that's a great question. And uh, for, for me, this is a funny question because, again, keep in mind that uh, I spent almost 10 years at Scylla. Uh, Scylla is a petabyte scale database. So when we, st- when we were starting this, uh, Pekka and I were always thinking, OK, so uh, maybe let's allow the creation of a small database, a couple of terabytes, and that should be enough, right? <laughs> but, <laughs> but, the use, but the use cases, uh, the use cases for... Uh, for that the, the, the are in the web, right? And, and that's not needed, right? So the, use, the usual use cases outside of like machine learning and big data are much, much, much smaller than that. Uh, it's doable to do a terabyte, but it starts to push the envelope a little bit because uh, it puts a lot of stress at the replication layer. Uh, and the way we charge it, uh, at least so far, uh, is that uh, we charge for uh, the storage on the replicas. Although we do have a feature that we're baking in to allow partial replication so you can control like which data goes where for a legal reason sometimes, uh, especially for the folks in Europe. Uh, but it's not, it's not a present thing. Uh, so uh, hundreds of gigs, I, I would say like it's a, it's a good maximum size, but a lot of those databases, they can get quite small. So they're very read intensive. So usually you don't write a lot. Uh, and it's one of the things, and that's why SQLite, I think it's, uh, and, and as a consequence, our fork, uh, is such a great fit for this is that again SQLite is not known to have very heavy write throughput, but you also don't need it. Those use cases are use cases are in which you don't write that much. Uh, you write a little bit, but then you really want to allow read heavy uh, 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 workloads. Read performance can really scale up. Uh, that, that's pretty easy. So I mean, we can support. Um, we haven't tested that far, but potentially even millions of uh, of reads a second uh, with you know compute. The compute cost scale <laughs> with that as well, yep. uh, but we, you know, things in the hundred thousand, hundred, hundred thousands of uh, reads per second uh, with maybe ten to a hundred gigabytes are, are the use cases that we support very well. Awesome, awesome. So, like one thing I always say when when evaluating new databases are like just sort of understand the trade offs of that database and and what it's going for. Absolutely, it sounds like a, a few of the things of just like um, is this a good fit? Or think about your database size. Think how much write versus versus read you have um, on that stuff. Any other like sort of um, features that may be lost from a traditional relational database or like, hey, if you're using this in a traditional relational database, maybe it won't be the right fit for it or anything else to look out for there. Yeah, so one, one thing you didn't mention, by the way, was the consistency guarantees, right? And, yeah. and, and the, the structure that you expect from your data because what we've seen a lot uh, with edge providers is that they will offer you a key value store. But key value is very simple to replicate, and sometimes it's eventually consistent. Uh, and so you, this is another thing for me to understand. So when I, when I write this data, do I need transactionality? So Turso will offer you transactionality. Uh, it will offer a so it will offer you access to data that can, it's passive replication. So it's going into like nerd, nerd sniping here that snapshot isolation. Uh, your data can be a couple of whatever latency hundreds of milliseconds old, uh, but you're never going to break a transaction boundary. If you transacted something, that, that is guaranteed to be consistent. So there's that. So it is a, it is a real SQL database allowed in like up to 26 regions. The trade-off with that is that, again, by choosing, we, ca- we could have built this with Postgres, and I understand that other people are trying to do, but then your cost would, would skyrocket. Uh, for, for this level of replication. We're building this with SQLite because we can offer like very little compute and very little, although again, you, you can get to, to the higher compute things, but uh, a little bit of compute and, and very little memory that SQLite uses. It's easy to put it everywhere. But then what you lose is again, the complexity of Postgres. Postgres has an uh, incredible amount of extensions, uh, incredible amount of things uh, that, that allows you to do like uh, plugins and, and whatnot, functions, so you lose a little bit of that. But by the way, it's entirely possible to have both. Uh, you can have a central database with all of your data doing part of your business intelligence, things that you don't need the edge. I'm not claiming, by the way, that you need the edge for everything. But there is a part of your data that if that data were to sit at the edge, that would have business value. So that is the data that you move to the edge, right? Uh, so it's a, it, the trade-off is, simp- it's, is simplicity. Uh, but but what I like about the most about, uh, what I like the most about our direction is that this is a simpl- this is a trade-off that for most users familiar with those technologies, it's already on your mind when you think SQL versus Postgres. 
the only the, what we're bridging is that you had the trade off. Like, oh, SQLite is great for those use cases as long as I don't need an, anything over the network. So it can bridge that. The other trade offs are still there. It's not going to be great for writes, um, although there are ways to improve it. Uh, you, you, uh, you, it's better for simpler things, not in terms of amount of transactions, but like if, if your use, if your use, usage of the database is simpler. Um, and that's, that's about it. Awesome. So you mentioned one thing. Is, so just to clarify, you know, if you have this configured with 10 different regions, one mm -hmm. of those is going to be the primary. All rights that's are right. going to go through yes. that primary and then replicate out. What does sort of um, latency look like for replication to those different regions? What, what's, you know, do you have like a range of what that looks like? Uh, but by the way, just, just about that, I mean, uh, I would clarify something just because I see lots of people getting confused with that. It was always possible to build distributed systems and replicated databases before, obviously, right? So this, this is not new. What I think is new about the edge is this paradigm in which you can do all of that in an automatic, transparent way without having to understand my primer is here, this is what's happening. So Turso will give you an URL, a URL, right? Uh, and this is the URL you're gonna use to query, write, do anything. And then everything is done automatically for you. Uh, when you set up a new replica, your application doesn't have to be aware of that. I will route you automatically to the right replica. Uh, and it's the same thing for the writes. So you can just write from any replica, and that replica routes to, to uh, the right place. So you don't have to worry about any of that. You just get your URL, and you write and read from it. Uh, one of the things that we always encourage the people in the beta to do is like, uh, although, you know, we always know that benchmarking is a pain because uh, you have, if you don't account for startup times, you, you see the wrong numbers, but like just uh, create a replica far away from you or create a primary far away from you, uh, start hammering the, the endpoint, then create a replica that is closer to you and you will see that automatically your latency just goes down. So, I mean, this is all automatic, including the primary. Uh, all of this to clarify, but now answering your question, uh, the replication the replication delay, assuming, of course, the system is not under an unreasonable amount of load, is essentially the latency between the primary and, and the replicas. So it could be 100, um, you know, maybe half a second, a second, something like that. Uh, so you may not have seen tra some transactions, uh, but whatever, again, whatever you see is transactionally guaranteed to be consistent. Awesome. Do I, do I start to see any... Um, longer delay or, or, or differences if I add more replicas, does that make any impact on sort of performance or, across, uh, as, I guess, like especially replication performance across replicas if I go from two to, <laughs> to 20 or anything like that? If, if the system is working well, no, but like uh, you seem to uh, have a, a lot of knowledge about databases, you understand that <laughs> databases sometimes don't work well. <laughs> yeah. And this is true across the board, right? Just uh, yeah. uh, there is always like, there is a reason why developers hate database so much. Uh, it's, it, it's hard. Uh, but like if, if the system if the system is working uh, correctly and it's properly sized and, and, and all that, then, then you shouldn't have a, a bigger delay. Uh, as I said, we're really architecting this for uh, up to hundreds of replicas. Um, hopefully, who knows, uh, down in the future, maybe even thousands. There's no just there's no need for this at the moment, but like uh, it, it's always fun uh, as engineers to think about those scenarios. But you shouldn't you shouldn't have uh, uh, any visible major replication delays. Yeah. Do you see any use of, of like dynamic replicas where maybe people spin up a replica for a few hours or, or a day to help something? Really? Oh man, that's, that's just so absolutely, wild. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and, yeah. and again, the reason, the reason for that, the reason for that is that, uh, uh, and, and, and by the way, the, the, so, so there is a, when you create a new replica, you need to move that, the, the whole data or assume part of that data to that region. And there is a delay. So you can't, you can't really do this at the millisecond level. Uh, might not even be able to do it at the second level. To, for us to replicate a small database, it takes around a minute or something like that. Uh, and of course, I mean, that's why we don't deal with terabyte size databases because then we would have to move the whole terabyte to the other side of the planet. Uh, but absolutely, let's say you have, you know that for whatever reason you're going to have something happening in Japan, you don't have any presence in Japan, it's going to last two days. Come up with a replica, do your Japanese stuff, shut it down, move along. Uh, and our pricing model comports that, right? So just uh, uh, for just for the record, like if you go to uh, our website, you will see that uh, uh, right now it's all free. Uh, there is a plan that you can pay for, uh, but it's not enabled yet. We're just putting it out there so people can see what the price is going to be. That's one of the feedbacks that we received a lot during the private beta. 
hey, but what if you charge me like a millions of dollars? I don't, I'm, I'm afraid to build on this. So you will see what the price will be and what, and some of what we will include. Uh, and, and we're hoping that by, uh, in, in a couple of months, we'll be able to, to start onboarding people into the paid plan. But, but the pricing model, uh, obviously open to change and open to feedback, but the pricing model that we're working on is essentially like based on the amount of storage and, and capacity and requests that you have done in, a, in, in each specific region. Uh, pro rata per day. So you can s essentially go and say, hey, let me spin up this replica for a couple of days, leave it there, take it down, uh, and, and really uh, follow your traffic. Yep. No. Was that a was that a hard conversation? I guess like um, you mentioned doing a lot of talking with customers about what they're looking for in a database. Was that pricing conversation? What was that like? Do people like more fixed, predictable stuff? Do they like the usage based? It, does it just vary? What's that no. look like? Pricing is fun because you ask uh, ten people and you get fifteen opinions, right? But then, uh, but some some of the some of the things that uh, that we've heard a lot is that people like abstraction. Right, people don't want to see pricing based on things that are not what they're doing. So, for example, compute, memory, uh, and, and things like that. Uh, so, we heard a lot that I would like to see pricing uh, essentially based on amount of storage uh, and amount of of requests that I do. Uh, I try to I try to even toy with a model in which we would essentially bundle one into the cost of the other. Uh, and just say, never pay me for, you know, just pay me per request. Don't pay me per storage. But it's hard because then you always have those use cases that are very skewed uh, from yep. one or the other. And, and you attract uh, all of those people because they're like, wow, exactly, this is a great deal exactly. for me. Yeah. 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 The yeah. same thing as the same problem that internet providers have when they say, we have an unlimited plan. Now you're getting all of the people who use a lot of data that is coming to you. Uh, so if I were to say, hey, uh, pay per request, don't pay per storage, that somebody would come with like a giant database on that. And, and if I would say paper storage, dumb paper request, boom. Uh, so you're, you're losing money essentially. It's very hard. But but at, but at least we, we don't want to talk in terms of, of CPUs or, or machines or anything like that. We want to talk about like requests, that, uh, bandwidth and those concepts that you understand. Um, I, I find it very... Uh, I don't like the... Although again especially you in the audience that if you disagree, let me know. We're always open to have this, this conversation, but I don't like very much the model. There is purely usage based, right? Uh, the model that I think works best is that when you have some plans that allow you to have some planning and, and some like fair usage within that limit. And then if you need more, uh, then you add more. And because what happens with usage based is that you always have to set very high caps anyway, right? If it's purely usage base and you never understand, uh, really. And, and this delta, this delta between like the zero and your first plan only matters for the really small developers anyway and the prototypers. And then what we've done is that we just made our free tier very generous. Our free tier already allows for replication. I mean, you can, uh, you can essentially get your database replicating to three regions, which is cloud level of, of, of replication, right? And in a free tier and, and do like a bid and request per month, something like that. So our free tier is very generous. And so for us, the way to bridge that gap between like a plan that is very cheap, that is uses page is just offer a free tier that allows you to run a production website really that, that doesn't have a lot of traffic. And then after that, you have a paid plan with, uh, with some limits. And if you need more, then we're happy to, to add more. Very cool. You mentioned a little bit earlier about like GDPR, data sovereignty type stuff that you can do yeah. sort of partial replication. Is that right? Yeah. And, and how does that, how do I sort of set that up if I want to say replicate these users, but not these users or, or something like that? Yeah. So again, I, I don't want to, it depends on how uh, engineer you want to be because like this is not a feature that exists. This is a feature that we are developing. So, and uh, although, I mean, this is a, obviously a great forum because if you as a user have a need for this, I would love to talk to you, understand a little bit better, like what are the things that matter to you. But what we were thinking uh, is essentially uh, allow the user to specify with some declarative language uh, what kind of data can, must, can, and cannot be in which region. Uh, and think about those regions in, in like really jurisdictional, geographical ways. Uh, and, and so essentially you could say, for example, this kind of data uh, goes in Europe. And it cannot leave Europe in any circumstance. Uh, this kind of data can never go into Europe uh, or, or Russia or, or not. I don't, I don't actually think we have regions in Russia, but uh, uh, it's something that you could say. Uh, the easiest way to do this is essentially to separate that per table. 
uh, and say, oh, this table. So if you have a table of European users, uh, the hardest way to do it is uh, per row. So you can essentially allow a row, it's a particular column, like a particular row, column is too granular, but particular row in your database to live in a region. Uh, and then there obviously there are the trade-offs uh, between those things. Uh, we want to keep this thing as simple as possible and lean on that edge simplicity. So I actually like the per table model, uh, but we're not married to that yet. And we're still developing. We're still trying to talk to uh, as many people as possible. So again, people in our public beta, uh, people who are uh, listening to this podcast, if you have the need, we would love to talk to you. But this is a feature that I think is very crucial to us, this ability to say, uh, and it, it could be non-jurisdictional as well. It could be just need-based. For example, you have a table of users in Japan, for example, then you don't you don't need to have this data replicated uh, all over the place, right? So you, you just replicate uh, well. Yeah, interesting. How hard, just thinking out loud too, with, you know, without that feature, how yeah. would it be, I assume it would be feasible for me to have even three database instances, you know, one that can be worldwide, one that's like Japan only and one that's Europe only. And then maybe in my application, I'm sort of looking at that user and saying, oh, this is a Europe user, write it to the Europe Europe database. Yeah. But that... You, you can, you can. And okay. for example, our our uh, basic plan, we already, the, our basic paid plan, we will already allow you to create more than one database. But the way, the, the way we're looking to this is that we're going to give you a number of things, instances, uh, and you can mix and match however you want. So let's say uh, the plan allows you to create just tossing up a number because again, the plan, plan is not available yet, so I reserve the right to change it sure, <laughs> for the yeah. launch day. But let's say it will allow you to create eight things. So that mean that could mean a database with with seven other replicas, or that could mean eight individual databases. Right? It's really we yeah. want to give the users this flexibility. So you could do this, uh, but what you're what you're losing with that is the ability to do joins across those tables and and keep the abstraction of SQL. We want to be uh, essentially offering as much as, as SQL as possible. So we want to do this on an abstracted way. But yes, it is entirely possible. So I mean, it's not like if you have this use case today, use case today, Torso will not serve you at all. Uh, is that like we want to essentially up uh, the abstraction and allow you to have, you know, the story is all about abstraction. I think the thing about the edge that's interesting is to, again, it's not geographical distribution that exists for years, decades, is the fact that this is now abstracted the way to policy. Uh, and this is abstracted away. Like you don't have to think about what wh what you're putting where. So we want to go more and more towards that abstraction. Yeah, very cool. Okay, so I want to shift gears a little bit. I mentioned earlier, like, hey, if you're choosing a new database, make sure you understand the trade-offs they're making, whether it fits right for you. The other thing I tell people is like, make sure the team is focused on operational excellence. You can trust them because like that's a that's a core area. You don't want someone sort of winging yeah. it by the seat of their pants. Um, you mentioned your background. I think you understand it a little bit, but like all that work on the Linux kernel, Scylla DB, like that is a serious team doing serious, serious use cases. Um, but tell me just like, what is it like building that, that foundation for a database service and building that underlying infrastructure and the operational excellence? Is that, I mean, is everyone reinventing the wheel here, all these different database companies, or what does that look like? No, I don't. I don't think people are reinventing the wheel. Uh, mm -hmm. Well, some some people are, uh, and, and in some cases do call for for a newer wheel. But uh, remember when I said in the beginning, like uh, we we didn't really want to just create a new database because that is reinventing the wheel. And by the way, we see a lot of new databases. I'm not going to go like uh, name anybody, uh, but there. It, this is a, a, an era in which a lot of new databases are coming up, and one of the things that lots of them try to do is break with SQL. Uh, essentially, uh, at the at the argument that oh, SQL is not the language that we need anymore, I, I have a problem with that because uh, you've probably heard that expression like "never bet against SQL." Yeah. Uh, and that that were a no SQL movement that MongoDB were, were crowned at, and again, Scylla was like that as well, Cassandra, etc. For some use cases in which you really do need to denormalize those things and etc. But what at Scylla, one of the things that uh, was annoying the most for our customers is that, you know, this breaking with SQL comes at a cost, like it comes at a cognitive cost that they don't want to pay. Uh, I've heard this from, from a person once that uh, I met at, at a conference that was involved with the Manhattan uh, database, not the Manhattan project. Like, yeah. Uh, that was the Twitter. Uh, is this the Twitter one? Okay. Yeah, the Twitter sure. one, yeah. 
And yeah. he nailed it. What he told me is that nobody likes eventual consistency. Nobody wants eventual consistency. People tolerate eventual consistency because it's the only way to achieve a certain thing, right? So another thesis that I have that pairs with the one that I mentioned about like who are the people making database decisions is that outside of the super big data use cases, like the recommendation engines and, and et cetera. So outside of that, the IoT sensors, the time series, if you exclude those folks, data is not really growing exponentially because what, what everybody says is though data is growing exponentially. At Scylla, we use this graph all the time. I mean, data is growing exponentially. But when you exclude those use cases, it really isn't. Compute and storage are growing much faster than data. Uh, so, for example, your product catalog is not growing exponentially. Right, lots of things are not growing exponentially. So when you look at MongoDB in, in, the, in the, when in 2010 or whatnot, when it was really popular, any website needed the horizontal scale, the web scale. You might have heard the, the YouTube video, the guy like MongoDB's yeah, web scale. Yeah. Like everything needed this. Now, like SQLite is enough for for a variety of use cases, right? SQLite, just like this thing that is like super simple. Uh, so and why is that? Because now you have servers that you didn't have back then. The servers grew a lot faster. The storage grew a lot faster, uh, and you can fit those things in an instance. So, what well, you know, go, going going more centrally to your question. So, I really think SQL is has to stay. SQL has to be central to that. And then again, why would you write a new SQL database? We're covered. Like we, we've got we've got three uh, there, there. So you don't need more. Uh, what you need is essentially a new way to interact with those databases and rethink. Like, what are the things that people need today that they didn't need 10 years ago? But that's not going to be at the database level. That's not going to be at the, you know, at the, at the core, at the storage layer, the language layer. I don't think that's where the, the innovation will come from. So when you look at the new companies looking at databases, I don't think, again, we're reinvent, reinventing the wheel uh, because we're all trying to do something slightly different for different markets, maintaining that core of a SQL database, like be it MySQL, Postgres, or SQLite, right? Yeah, I love that. I, th those are some great points, especially like what type of data is growing. That core data, I, I agree, is like yeah. usually pretty small. Like if it's not data that has a timestamp with it, it's probably not probably, growing exactly. great, you know, and, and, yeah. and, and things like that. That's a that's a great point. I I think I worded that question wrong, but in I was thinking more just like in terms of building the foundation of just like backups and replication and and sort of the operation and, and yeah. visibility to the customer and things like that is that pretty hard to build that for you know a, a new database and and like i guess how much of your team is focused on the pure operational aspects of of sort of having a managed database company yeah so lots lots of things are made simpler by today's infrastructure so for example as i mentioned in the past uh, we are using Fly.io uh, as a platform, uh, and although we may consider in the future adding other platforms just to expose, just to essentially allow customers to have lower latency, uh, we don't want to go down deep the Kubernetes hole. Uh, I happen to believe, this is again a personal, maybe I shouldn't say that to like a flame war, et cetera, but I happen to believe personally. <laughs> we're 35 minutes in, you know, <laughs> if we're hiding it. We got the true believers yeah, here. So but, but, but like, a, I, I, I happen to believe that Kubernetes was the mankind's second biggest mistake uh, as a species, right? I, I, I truly don't like it. I mean, uh, the, there, there you go. I said it. Maybe somebody's going to try to murder me today. But like, so yeah. we don't. One of the things that make it a lot simpler is that we're not managing at this level, right? When you manage at this level, it's everything is a lot harder. So on Fly.io, you still have VMs and etc. But you have a lot of the infrastructure that they have essentially built for you already. So there's that. Uh, again, also. It's not trivial. I don't want to trivialize that, but this is not the biggest problem we have. Again, just because there's so much stuff around those solutions today, right? So there's so much stuff around those solutions. Uh, and backups for us kind of come for free uh, because what we've done, uh, just you know, getting a little bit technical, is that we've virtualized the SQLite right ahead uh, log. 
Uh, again, SQLite doesn't allow you to do it, which is one of the reasons we forked on the technical side. But so everything that that is seen as a new write is on the SQLite write ahead log. Other technologists try to hook up at the file system level and understand what's going into the write ahead log. We don't think this is the right way to build it. This was essentially built this way by some uh, other uh, projects because you can't get a SQLite will not accept contributions, right? Uh, which is something, but the, uh, we just forked it. Uh, and then we see every stream of changes that SQLite has is seen by our technology. So the same thing that we use to push to a replica, we can push to S3. Uh, and then you compact it every now and then, so you don't have an infinite write, uh, write ahead log, uh, but you always have like the latest uh, snapshot and a, and a bunch of changes. So the, the, tech, the, same, the same thing that we use for replication, we use for backups. Uh, and because we were making a database for replication, uh, the backups were, weren't that hard. Uh, I guess you can lose your data if uh, Amazon goes down. Uh, it's possible, I guess, uh, forever. Like if Amazon closes shop, Silicon Valley Bank did. Maybe Amazon will <laughs> one day as well. But I'm not betting on it, so that's fine. Uh, and we're just doing like S3, D2, whatever. And yeah, when you say you're so you're snapshotting, you're replicating the right ahead log to S3. How how frequently do you do you do that on every single commit? Right. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Wow. Pretty cool. Um, okay, you mentioned a little bit about forking SQLite. You mm -hmm. created libsql there. Um, you mentioned part of that, you know, um, sort of it, SQLite was open, is open source, but they don't mm -hmm. really ex accept external contributions. Yeah. Um, what are some differences, some things you've had, you've added to libsql? You mentioned the write ahead log. What, what else, um, yeah. what was key for you? SQLite, SQLite is, is, is actually, I mean, they are open source. They're more than open source. They're public domain. I mean, public domain is like really like no restrictions. Right. But if you go to their website, what they say is that they are open source, not open contribution. And again, this is a statement that they made. Uh, it's not a statement that we're making. And the fun fact is that it's actually not impossible to contribute to SQLite. I actually met a person who did it. Uh, it's just not welcome. Right. So yeah. and I want to make something clear. There's nothing wrong with that. SQLite absolutely is a very foundational core and well written and well maintained piece of technology. I just don't think that this idea that for you to have something that is critical and mission critical and, 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 and simple, uh, you must not accept contributions or, or make them very hard. Again, we come from Linux. Linux, uh, Linux was much bigger, of, of course, but uh, Linux was much, much, was much bigger in code size. You had a lot of builds of Linux that were targeting embedded systems, right? So we built this in one, Linux didn't start as an embedded system, uh, operating system, but when they need the rows, uh, okay, so let's find a way to keep the big server and, and we did it, right? But just by, by taking all those stakeholders into account, so you had all the configuration flags and, and, and variables to disable parts of the subsystem, you would still have a large code base, but you will have a build that would run on any platform. Right. So, so we just we just never believe uh, that you know it's a necessity, although it is their right uh, to keep uh, to make contributions this hard. Uh, so we want to first and foremost, okay, we really wanted we've seen this renaissance in which everybody's looking at SQLite, and we wanted to have something that different people building with SQLite could convene and could come. We know it's a hard task. We know it's going to take years until you, you develop this trust and et cetera. Uh, and we're a small team. So what we're doing is just welcoming people uh, who can come. We already had some contributions from the community. Uh, and we're building this, the features that we need, uh, essentially. Uh, but the features that we built, first of all, was the virtualization right, of the write ahead log. So what is in LibSQL is just the technology that allows the write ahead log to be virtualized, virtualized. And then our product inserts like whatever we want to do, our business logic. We allowed, uh, we also allowed you to create uh, user defined functions in WebAssembly. Again, SQLite does support uh, user defined functions, but you have to do it in C and you don't have a language support to do this. Uh, so you, with libsql, you can just do create function, uh, and then you name your function. You put a WebAssembly function there that you can usually compile from your own language. Like uh, we, we do a lot of Rust, so you, you can do that. So you can allow those functions store, to operate like store procedures. Uh, and we're now toying uh, with uh, adding CRDTs, which is actually going to be a community contribution as well. We've been talking to an engineer. Uh, former Facebook. I actually want to have a shout out to his project, VLCN.io. 
that essentially has an extension for SQLite uh, for CRDTs. And we want to integrate that natively with, uh, with LibSQL as well. First of all, I love the, the direction. Uh, second, I think at some point to allow fast rise from the edge, you need something like that as well in the future, right? So those are those are a couple of examples. And then there's some minor differences, some of them very minor. For example, we wanted to add a row counter. Uh, why? Because as I mentioned before, we want to charge you per rows. We don't want to be charging you per CPUs and etc. SQLite tracks a bunch of okay. things about the request. It doesn't track the number of rows. This is so minor. And again, in yeah. Linux, it's something that a bystander would come uh, and just contribute, like it's a small patch, we're gonna track the rows, boom. And then you may have a discussion with this person, oh, are you sure this is not impacting performance? You run a bunch of stuff. It, it, again, Linux is not a project known to accept anybody's contributions willy-nilly. I mean, it is yeah. hard, but there is a process, a path and a way. You can do it. Right, and, and it's doable. And there's the sense that we want this community to form. Uh, so I mean, from the small stuff, like uh, just really a row counter, so we can charge people per row, uh, for to more complicated things like CRDTs, WebAssembly, uh, user-defined functions, write ahead log virtualization. Those are some examples of things that we have in LibSQL. Uh, the, the one I like the most though, that I, I haven't mentioned is what we call bottomless storage. So you it, this is not for Turso, uh, although we use it internally to do the backups, but bottomless storage essentially allows you to, uh, to have a local SQLite database. You don't even need the HTTP things that is writing to S3. So as you are dealing with your local file, uh, this is all being backed up automatically to S3, and then you can do failover. Uh, you can you can get it back from S3. We also want to do partial, uh, essentially partial materialization, so you can keep some pages on S3 and some pages locally, right? So yeah. if if you if you have a disaster scenario, uh, it crashes. You start you start LibSQL starts right away. Again, this is not implemented yet, it's future. Uh, you, you don't have to download the 100 gigabyte database and then start operating because you can, down, you can download pages uh, uh, as needed. So there's a bunch of interesting things that we're doing uh, in general with the product. Yep, very cool. A lot of stuff that like, yeah, if you're, if you're building for this more serverless replicated environment yeah. rather than the embedded or, or different things like that that SQLite was originally used for, um, you have a need for. So that's, that's awesome. Um, Last thing I want to ask you before we we sort of wrap this up, like you know, you you've seen a lot from from working on the Linux Linux kernel, working at, at Scylla, and the amazing like performance stuff they were doing there with Threadbare Core and everything. Yeah. What's exciting you either in the world of databases or systems or just performance, like anything, uh, you know, get, getting you excited? Uh, absolutely. Uh, f first yeah. of all, the perform every time every time abstractions rise, performance work gets so much more interesting. Uh, and harder because I mean you used to operate with with some guarantees they're just out of they're not there anymore right uh, and it changes a lot so uh, things things for example uh, like code starts in serverless functions um, I, I I get very excited about that because you have lots of those technologies uh, you, we're seeing by the way this is I had no exposure to the TypeScript world before but I'm seeing this thing with Prisma and Drizzle. Uh, right. So, so you, you have like this very heavy server that is designed to operate in a server environment. Uh, it's a huge binary. Now you want to download that binary, uh, and, and, you know, and, and, and keep it going. If you're, if you have a long lived server, that's fine. If you have a serverless function that has to do it over and over again, I mean, that's adding that, that it becomes a performance problem. So you want those super, super light payloads to be in your serverless function. I get really excited about this kind of, uh, this kind of investigation. Uh, another thing that is more, uh, again, we, that's not something that impacts our product, but I, I reserve the right for to users, be excited yeah. about other stuff. <laughs> yeah, but one, one, one thing that affects our product that I, I'm very excited about is that when you start pushing this boundary of edge, uh, right, and again, I do think SQLite is uh, the right foundation to build upon. Is that okay? Now you're at the edge. Uh, what's next? And what's next is the browser, the, the device, and, and etc. Operating transparently. Right? So push your database, and now you have encryption problems to solve. And encryption problems are performance problems to some degree because encrypting things is easy. <laughs> encrypting things in a way that doesn't destroy your performance is harder. Right, so how are you gonna how are you gonna essentially push those partial databases uh, not only inside your Vercel functions but uh, maybe all the way up to your browser and do it in a performant way that you can allow like writes not to suck so much and still operate those databases. Super excited about it. And also, like, what does it mean for GraphQL uh, if you can have a copy of your database with the data that you need 
in your browser? Like, do you still need GraphQL and, and things like that? Uh, so those, those are all things that, you know, I get very excited about. Yeah. Oh, it's so, it's so interesting with the, with the, the updates in devices and just library, like all these new patterns and things like that. It's, uh, it's, it's a fun time to be working on tech and we didn't even get into, yeah. you know, if AI doesn't kill us, stuff, right? right. Yeah. 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 All that if, AI, stuff. if AI doesn't kill us, I, which in my opinion, Skynet and all, uh, we'll, we'll have a, an interesting future ahead. Yeah, awesome. Well, I, I really appreciate you coming on. If for everyone that's listening, go check out Tourso. You know, it's it's available in, in public beta now, so you can you can check that out and reach out to Glover and his team and, and let them know, you know, what use cases, what needs, or anything you have there. Uh very receptive um to awesome. feedback here. So Glover Costa, thank you for coming on. Awesome. Absolutely. Likewise. Likewise. Thank Thanks, you. Glover.